<laughs> God, this is so mysterious and it's so wonderful. May we not be flippant about your holiness. May we not be unrepentant before the Spirit of God who, who readies the heart for perfect worship, pure worship, by convicting us of our sinfulness and then reminding us of the grace that has cleansed us, made us pure and righteous with the very righteousness of the Son of God. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You are so holy. You are so other. And you invite us to participate in that inheritance as your children. Work in ways that only you can work today, I pray to God, for your glory, for our good, for the advancement of your kingdom, I pray. Amen. If you haven't yet, kids are dismissed for Children's Church, but... Um, Mm, that's good. It's good to sing his praises, isn't it? Uh, there was once a, a young gentleman studying to, uh, to become a doctor. And in his final uh, clinical rotations, he ended up meeting a young, a young gal. Uh, had a storied and checkered past and brokenness and relational abuse and things of that nature. It was very, very difficult, but as the Lord would have it, by grace, they, they met, dated, got married, grew and started to have a healthy relationship by, by the work of the Lord in their midst. Uh, being a, a doctor and uh, somebody who was big on his community, he was frequently invited to these uh, fundraising banquets, uh, and, 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 and he would always and only attend with his beloved wife. But at one particular banquet that he was in attendance, socializing and connecting with other supporters of the cause, as they were talking, this young lady spotted across the room a, a former... Uh, partner who had been abusive. And, and in this moment, something quite remarkable happened. She had remembered that she had come with a, a strong and kind man who loved her. She remembered uh, the process and the insecurities that had plagued her had found a new meaning and, 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 and healing through the work of God. And, and even though she spotted this person, the insecurities that begin as a flutter and take over with that emotional tornado were set aside as she stepped back in to the arm of her husband. The conversation of the small group, and they continued. See, this moment of testing turned into a moment of trusting the progress of her healing, even as she enjoyed the intimate security in the presence of safe strength. This is an odd story to share as we talk about prayer. But I want to talk about intimate prayer. Jesus teaches his disciples to begin praying with two really amazing and presumptuous words. Our Father. Our approach to God is as our Father. It's, it's amazing to me. The strong, secure, intimate presence of God is, is the inescapable reality for the Son of God as He approaches Him in prayer, in abiding prayer, requesting uh, the will of God in prayer. Think, think about it. Consider even the, the Lord's prayer apart from this reality of encountering Him as a Father. If God is this the unstable dictator, you're never going to say, your will be done. You would never say that. Your will be done, maybe in some other region of the world, but never in my life. I would never wish for that ill will in my world. If he was uncaring or incapable of supplying, you would never go to him for daily bread because he wouldn't care about your need. But even that request is rooted in the shared history of Israel of knowing this God intimately who provided his, his daily, dependable, miraculous supply of manna from heaven so they would learn to trust in him. He is a caring and capable deity. God is not a tyrant or you would not dare to ask him for forgiveness. Think about that part of that prayer. Forgive, forgive me as I've forgiven others. You don't go to a dictator with that request or your head rolls its way out the building. But he is the one who says, certainly come to me for forgiveness. Experience 
my grace. Our Father. Our Father. Strong and secure. Intimate presence of God is a reality that was inescapable for the Son of God and it would be my contention today for you that all biblical prayer must proceed from a place of intimacy with God. All biblical prayer must proceed from a place of intimacy with God. And we, we glimpse this instinctual longing for intimacy in the Christ child at the end of Luke 2. We've just survived Christmas. I mean, thrived and enjoyed the <laughs> holiday music and the uh, <coughs> credit card bill from those presents. But after recording this miraculous story at the beginning of his chapter in Luke of the, of the coming sent Messiah of the world, it would seem that life goes back to normal. Mary and Joseph and Jesus, well, they, they have a hiatus in Egypt and then moved to Nazareth at about the time of two or three years of age. But the next thing we hear, Jesus is 12, right? But then we catch up after this time warp, a preteen Jesus goes with his, his family to the Passover supper. And the whole family, as they're done with their festivities, load up, they assemble this caravan for some cross-country travel to go back to Nazareth. They get a ways into the journey and discover that Jesus is nowhere in sight. Uh, they go back, searching frantically for Jesus. They can't find him. Where's he at? He's been three days in the temple, sitting among the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, asking them questions, amazing them. Perhaps uh, this could be because of his curiosity or the knowledge that he had even as a young man. Maybe he was beginning to put the pieces together of his own story. Wait a second, there's a Messiah coming from, from Bethlehem. There's also a Messiah coming from Egypt. How does, this, how does that work, right? Maybe he's putting this stuff together. We don't know. But suddenly when his, his parents come back on the scene, uh, they, they are quite distressed and they can't find him. And they seek him out and they discover him surprisingly calm. In fact, Jesus is perplexed at their concern. And he actually instructs his parents a little bit and says, were you not looking for, why are you looking for me? Did you not know? I must be in my father's house, the temple, the temple courts. This is the dwelling place of God among God's people, the presence of God dwelling among God's people. Jesus, as the son of God, must be in his father's presence. And this wasn't a passive-aggressive jab at his stepdad, Joseph. Yeah, no, this, this was a genuine love for the presence of God. He instinctively longed for and sought it out. And this contentment in the presence of God continued to mark his ministry, didn't it? Frequently, he would leave his 12 at times most inconvenient. He, he's just healed Peter's a mother-in-law of sickness, and all these people were gathering for him, but the next morning he leaves and goes to a destitute place to pray. Disciples are like, hey, where you been? There's people to heal. He's like, no, nah, we're moving on. He, he goes across the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee and, and feeds a whole mass of people, 5,000 plus with five loaves and two fishes, and as soon as they are satisfied, with their meal, he heads off to the wilderness to pray, leaving his disciples to taxi their own way back and the crowds confused at his departure. <laughs> See, he was so concerned about obedience to the Father's will because he knew his Father's heart so well. He was steeped in his Father's word and it was his every desire to honor and love his Father. And so it's my contention that biblical prayer proceeds from a place of intimacy with God. Please join me in the book of Ephesians. And this is an interesting topic for me. I can't just go to our Father, two verse, two words, and, and, and rattle off. But as I began thinking about what it is that gives us a place of intimacy with God, I just kept coming back to our new identity as adopted children of God. So join me in Ephesians 1, if you will. And uh, we're going to read eight verses, starting in verse uh, 3. Um, and that's what I'd like to, to preach on, but I, I do need to give you a disclaimer that there's a whole lot more here than we can give justice for today. So uh, please be gracious to me and uh, take as many sips from the fire hose as you can without getting hurt. 
uh, but enjoy, enjoy the Word of God today. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he has chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he's blessed us in the beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He's lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. I'd like to think that two minutes of reading was more than one verse, but really it was, or one sentence, but with Paul, you can't, you can't escape his, his, his uh, long-windedness. Um, but I want to hone in on a key phrase for us today, predestined for adoption. For those of you on the up and up, no, you didn't accidentally slip your way into a Calvinistic workshop on the five points of John Calvin. I've entitled it predestined for adoption because... That's what the Bible says. So, let's go back to that verse again and just read it again. In love, verse 5, He predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. This is amazing, isn't it? In chapter 2, He's telling us that children of wrath is what we once were. Sons and daughters of disobedience, disciples of the devil, that's the crowd that has been welcomed in and adopted as children. Intimate prayer hinges on this gospel reality, this transition from children of darkness and sin, children of wrath, sons of disobedience, and disciples of Satan being welcomed in as sons and daughters. That reality will drastically change how you approach God in prayer. Even the fact that we would say brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, this language of familial familiarity is steeped in this new identity as shared members of his family. And I could leave this gospel truth here, and I think it would do us some good. I leave that fruit on the vine, admiring it, but if you're willing to go with me, I'd like to take it off the vine, crush it, and let the sweet flowing realities of the gospel wash over us even a little bit more today. So indulge my efforts to show you from this text three layers of redemption history, okay? I, I don't want to make this super complicated, but this shapes our entire Christian worldview. And so I want you to grasp our new identity. First of all, God's plan unfolds for God's glory. We see that right out in the clear, right out in the open. His plan is unfolding according to the purpose of His will, according to His timing that He has put forward. It's unfolding for His maximum glorification, that people might see and behold His goodness and give Him the praise due His name. And Paul is convinced, as I am, that He will receive the maximum glory that is due to His name only when you behold, apply, and appreciate the blood of of Christ. He's come to see that in, the, in verses 5 and 6 here, according to the purpose of His will, it's the praise of His glorious grace with which He's blessed us in the Beloved. See, it's His redemption of the children of God through His blood that puts His grace on display. It's that display of grace received, understood, and remembered in every aspect of life that will result in the praise of His glorious grace. And Paul even has the authenticity to say, I don't always get this. This is in verse 9. It's a mysterious plan, but it's His plan no less. That at the fullness of time, Jesus was sent as the Son of God to redeem again a people of God's own possession. The mystery of God's activity gives us security. 
when we, when we grasp at it biblically. For some of us, we might come out of life situations or uh, church history where the sovereignty of God or the notion of His control is a very scary thing. But when we come to understand the capable hands of a good and sovereign king, we actually come to pull in and trust more intrinsically his nature and character that is continuously displaying his grace through Jesus. This is why we're told in Romans 8, Paul, one of our favorite verses, right? We know that for those who love God, all things work together for his good, according to his his, uh, purposes. We need that reality, this gospel reality of His working for His glory and our good to stabilize us because life is not always good. Life is sometimes insanely hard and we need to grasp that the things unfolding in time are okay because God is good. He is at work. If He has not spared His own son and and, and spared the opportunity to call you His own daughter and son, that He will not spare anything of His presence as you walk through a treacherous Life, stabilizing you in the midst of chaos. Layer one of redemption history is that God's plan unfolds for God's glory. Number two we see in this text is that God's children are lovingly predestined for adoption. This is a glorious mystery of God's plan that his children have been predestined for adoption. And it's almost like Paul, with all these words, he's he's reaching into every corner of the dictionary to put words out to explain how profound and glorious this reality is. Can you get your mind around it? That God from eternity past has had a plan to redeem His people by the blood of His own Son? This isn't a reactionary plan to what happened in the Garden of Eden. This is a plan from the beginning of time. Revelation 13 tells us the book of life had been authored, written, and recorded before anything had been created. And so we see here then that we can, we can lean in and trust that this mysterious redemption plan puts His supreme glory on display as He brings us back. And then we get to experience the freedom and the joy of such a pardon. Father God mercifully intercepts every hell-bound bastard to welcome them home. Once not a people, now his people. To be his beautiful and beloved, his saved and wonderful child, his precious daughter, and his beloved son. Again, my contention is this changes how you look at God. (laughs) God's children are lovingly predestined for adoption. And God's Spirit validates our new adoption identity. You see, that children have been predestined for adoption, this is a commentary on God's glorious plan, His glorious and mysterious plan of redemption. It's an abstract concept that We should say yes and amen to, but it comes home to us. It makes sense to us when the very Spirit of God, our inheritance, takes up residence with inside of us. And that's what he's saying. This is his flow of logic. We've been predestined for adoption, and only God's children are in line to receive his inheritance. And so John says in 1 John 3, see, this is a true thing. See what love the Father has poured out on us? That we would be his children. And indeed, we are. This isn't, as as, uh, Eugene Peterson says in the message often, this isn't pie in the sky. This is real. It is tangible. It is known and it's experienced. And for those who've gone from death to life, who walk in the power of the Spirit, everything I'm saying makes sense. Absolutely. I know who I am because I've been given a totally new identity. I know what I'm capable of. And what I'm no longer in bondage to because of what I've been set free from by the indwelling Spirit of God giving me power to overcome. He starts this saying, children of God, right? They're blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Friends, let me ask you, what is the blessing of the heavenly places? It's the presence of God. 
What is heaven? It's the dwelling place of God, right? The blessing of heaven is the presence of God. So if you've received the blessing of heaven, what does it mean? You've received the very presence of God within you. And this is only for children. This is an inheritance. He says this in in verses 11, 12, and 13. You've obtained an inheritance, predestined again, it says, according to the purpose of Him who works everything according to His will. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Who? Who is in line? You know, um, I could ask Silas uh, in our midst here, but uh, who it is that gets, uh, gets bequeathed something in a will? Well, anybody who's named in a will is bequeathed something. But only children, only heirs need no will. For everything that was before them as their fathers is now theirs. And it's theirs after death. It's the death of Christ that makes possible your adoption so that you can become his children and receive as his heirs the inheritance of the Spirit of God who lives in you, animates the very works of God through you (laughs) to the praise of his glorious grace. (laughs) It's mysterious and it's profound, but it's wonderful. It's wonderful. The adoption of God's children has been bought with Christ's blood. It has been verified by the Father. It has been sealed as done by the Spirit. These are the layers of God's redemption plan in history. God's plan is unfolding for His glory. His glory is on the best display through the loving sacrifice of His Son to redeem you as His beloved people, adopted children. Adopted children who know they're adopted because they have a new inheritance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Perhaps you're thinking, Micah, this is fascinating, but what does this have to do with prayer? (laughs) I submit our gospel identity has everything to do with prayer. And this is why if you don't know that you're his child, If you don't walk in the power of the Spirit, haven't experienced the fellowship of His presence with you, I don't know that I can go further without telling you. You have no intimate intimate audience with God apart from Christ. Do you get this? We don't need to cower in fear from God because our rebellion gets pardoned by the blood of the Lamb and our sin debt is paid to be restored. We don't need to stand back at a a distance for we have been those welcomed near. Friends, the veil of separation has been torn from the presence of God and no, uh, no, no needle could be forged strong enough to bind it back together to separate you from Him. Christ has gone before you and made a way. And God is our Father. He's not a, a disinterested stepdad. He is not a a negligent or absent father. He's our heavenly father, strong and yet soft, uh, caring but powerful, approachable, yet protection. Every asset of heaven could justifiably be used against you in your sin and now it put at, at, at work for you as you are his child. Intimate prayer is only possible for God's children. So do you believe this? Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you put your saving confidence in Christ alone and in nothing else? I've been meeting with a variety of people lately that I'm not always 100% sure of where they're at in their walk with God. I've I've been meditating like, God, how, how do I explain what faith is? If you attended the funeral here a few days ago, I shared this example there, but but I'm going to share it again because I think it's, it's just helpful for us. Like, you know, at first, um, you ever been watching, like, uh, on whatever method you watch, uh, so many of us are using small screens now, but an ad pops up, like one of those 15-second ads that you can't, like, skip, right? And it's Subway, and they're, they're cramming down your face that they've got this new menu. And uh, did you know, by the way, that they have a sub now called the Monster? It's good stuff. It's cheesecake. And bacon. Yeah, 
Yeah, Todd knows. <laughs> so they, they, they put this ad up. You cannot skip it. At first you were angry that they were bothering, and now you're just hangry because you need something to eat. <laughs> and, and something might happen, something quite subconscious for most of us, that we begin to process the situation. We take stock. Okay, there's this new hunger that's been arisen. Can we do something about that? Is there a subway in Redwood? Yes, there is. Am I hungry? Not important right now. I'm getting something to eat. <laughs> do I have money? Yeah. Do I have means of travel? Yes. Can I trust that Subway can actually make the sandwich that they've promised? Yeah, I think so. Then I will go and get a sub. Faith moves toward that which has been offered. This 15-second annoyance of an advertisement became a messenger of good news to slake your hunger and you trusted it and did something about it. I've given you testimony from Ephesians 1 that there is this God. He's not a father at a distance, but he has made access to himself by the presence of his spirit through the blood of his son. And I ask the question to you, do you need to be saved? Yeah. Do you want to be saved? Yeah. Is someone able to save me? Hebrews 7 helps us. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Yeah. Then in the middle of a message on prayer, why don't you let your prayer to God be? I am a sinner. You are a capable and strong Savior. That which has been offered, you can supply. I believe. I believe. I trust you. I receive my new identity as your child. I receive the Holy Spirit of God to give me my inheritance. I believe. It's set simple. Go to Subway if you're hungry. Go to Jesus if you need to be saved. Intimacy with God is exclusively through Christ, but Christ opens the door that all who wish to enter may enter through faith. How amazing is this? And just like that, you come to appreciate that from the beginning of time, he's had a plan that in love to predestine you for adoption. Designed and created in the image of God, you are capable of having an intimate fellowship with him. And this affects how we pray. Speaking of Speaking of uh, our identity, let's return back to this. One more passage. In Romans 8, Paul is doubling down in a separate letter with this, this content. And I won't expound it near as much, but I want us to catch some key things from this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 14, are sons and daughters of God. For you didn't receive a spirit of slavery to go back to fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, that we cry out, Abba, Father. See, it's the Spirit Himself who bears witness within our spirit that we are His children. And if we're children, we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we will be glorified with Him. It's the Spirit of God inside of you that cries out with that confirming voice, I am your child, Father. This is a crying out of desperation. It's a crying out of certainty that he hears you. It's a crying out of certainty he responds to you. It's an intimacy wrought by the abiding presence of the Spirit active in the life of a believer. And we're going to unpack some of the further implications of this in the next two weeks as we deal with uh, urgent prayer and expectant prayer. But, but I want to close with this intimate prayer that Paul seems to double down on back in Ephesians. Because he actually, he, he, he tells them all these truths and then says, by the way, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. He does that two more times in the book of Ephesians. And so I just want us to, to grasp how this new identity affects what we should expect in our prayer life. Ephesians 1, 16, um, if you're still open, stay right there with me. I don't cease to give thanks for you, Paul says, remembering you in my prayers. 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, might give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. So the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened. She would know what is the hope to which He's called you. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? And it goes on, and I, I hate cutting off a good verse like this, a good passage. And this is an oversimplification, but He's praying that the Holy Spirit would awaken new depths of understanding of God's nature and His character. A new reality of a new vision of who God is would keep you tucking in. Every time you look out, like the woman at the beginning of our story today, and you see the threats to your security, you see threats uh, to your confidence, you lean back in to the Father who has secured you with His presence. And so that you're aware, only in knowing the nature and experiencing the, uh, uh, creating a new history with God based on His Word, that you will, will you trust Him? Will you lean on Him instead of be carried away by each and every fearful opportunity and temptation to turn away? The Scripture is God's revelation of truth, and He's praying for them. Would you have your eyes enlightened? See who God is. See His power. See His power is expended for you. If you don't see that, you won't trust Him. You won't lean in on Him. And so you see, you need to know who you are, who God is, what He's done to secure your place in His presence, or you won't lean into Him when it gets hairy. You will still try to figure out how to do it on your own. You'll lean to all kinds of worldly spiritual things to give you peace, and they always fail you. Why? Because only Jesus can give you His peace. And so He's praying this for them. Because he recognizes it's our human temptation to not do this, to to, to profess faith in God, but then look for something else to satisfy us. And so he's praying for them, he's interceding, God, would they know you, the truth of who you are, the reality of your presence in them, giving them power to overcome? Would they come to see? Would God's word shape their expectations? Would it define what flourishing looks like for them? One more in Ephesians 3, if I may. Flip it over to Ephesians 3. This is one of the most famous and common prayers that we pray, and for good reason. He prays that the knowledge of God will fill God's people with the fullness of His presence. Ephesians 3, 14. This reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He would grant to you to be strengthened with power, through His Spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted, grounded in love, would have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, what is the length and the height and the depth. And you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you could be filled with the fullness of God. What is he praying? He's praying to them to know him intimately. His prayer to the Father is that they would know the intimate love of the Father as made manifest, made known through Christ. I know we live in a time where it can sometimes be faux pas to speak about spiritual warfare, but why do you think he keeps saying they need to know about the power that is theirs? Because you're going to get your butt kicked if you don't have the power of God in this life, what do you think mental health is? What do you think anxiety? What do you think this is all, the, this is all a powerful, unseen warfare that we are losing? But we don't need to. Because if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. And if you're his child, you have the inheritance. You have the Spirit of God that testifies to a completely different reality than everything else around you. It's the presence of God by virtue of the Spirit of God that gives the power of God to the believer to overcome in this life, rooted, grounded. We're not talking about shifting and shaking up today, down tomorrow. We're talking solid and secure in the presence of God whose presence is in you. It's my contention. The biblical prayer proceeds from a place of intimacy with God and God's done everything to prepare that place for you. Take it by faith. Press in 
Let the Word of God inform your prayers, inform your concepts of God, and redefine what flourishing in this life knows and looks like. See, intimacy with God is exclusively through Christ. You know, anyone who's been married for any amount of time knows that intimacy is on the far side of shared experiences which inform our history. Intimacy with God is a day-to-day walking and abiding as you grow in the knowledge of God and experience the faithfulness of God and grow in your faith in God. Intimacy, intimacy that God loves for, longs for, through your inheritance. As you dwell in the Word of God, and the ever-expanding knowledge of God provides you with the security of the presence of God, you will walk in the victorious power of God because you've been informed and intimate prayer produces effective prayer. We'll get into more of that in the weeks to come. Jesus, we come before you. I hope, I hope we're thankful. Thankful for what you've done. We just sang, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In our wildest imagination, children of wrath have no place in that presence. <laughs> but the fullness of time and the mystery of your plan, you had chosen in love to predestine, adopt yours as your own, blood-bought children, to bask in your presence, to experience your freedom and joy, and to live in victory on a mission, to testify to this glorious truth to the ends of the earth. God, would that motivate us? Would it shape how we live our lives? When we're struggling to carve out five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes to give to you, would the reality of what you've done, not out of guilt or shame, but out of genuine love and affection, suck us away? I'm so guilty of of busy life demanding and dictating my schedule, and I'm sick of that. I want to be like Jesus, starting out saying, no, I've got to get away. I've got to get away from the demands for a moment to, to, to rest in the restorative presence of God, to, to download his plan for today. In fact, this is what marks us off as your people. We're no longer slaves or strangers, but friends, for you've taken that which you've understood from God and you've given it to us now. Will we not squander that revelation and that invitation for intimate abiding with you? And God, it is my hope and it is my prayer that the word of God would richly dwell in us, the truths of you would inform our prayers, we would see effective prayer. We would see the people we've been praying for come back to you. We'd see neighbors come to Christ. Or we would see victory in our own temptations and addictions. We would see our own tone with one another within this church, within our families and marriages change. We would see that because we're abiding intimately because you've carved out a space in your presence. We never take that for granted. In Jesus' name, amen.